Hey guys, I'm back. So today I'm doing the um, another uh, detailed Fermilab video. Again, I apologize for not having pictures um, of everything. At one point, I was on the 15th floor. I actually took pictures of their of their pictures because uh, the pictures had labels on it and so on. So if I'm showing pictures, pictures it's not the most exciting. But bear with me because you know I couldn't get pictures of everything. So I hope you don't mind. So um, this video is about ex the accelerator chain, obviously uh, because of the name. So by accelerator chain, I mean anything and everything doing with accelerating particles except for Tevatron. Tevatron was going to get its own separate video that I'm going to do sometime in the future. Um, so, you know, be ready for that. But this can cover everything from the proton source to the recycler to the anti-proton source and Linux, whatever. So I'm just going to talk about it, all the details that I learned um, on the tour. So, um, I'm going to start out with their proton source. Um, it's it's obviously hydrogen. I, they weren't I wasn't told that, but it's it's pretty much obviously hydrogen because that's cheap, simple. Um, but what they do once they get the source is they um they what they do is you would normally think that they would strip off the electrons to get a charge. So um but instead of um uh, in, instead of stripping off the electrons to get a positively charged hydrogen ion, they actually add a second electron. The way they do is they have some cesium and they heat it up, and apparently heated cesium loves to give up electrons. I don't know how hot they have to heat it up to, but it gives off electrons. So now this is actually a negative proton ion, or sorry, negative hydrogen ion, a proton with two electrons in the electron cloud. And so this they can accelerate because it has a negative charge, because the negative charge from one electron and the proton cancel out, and that leaves you with negative charge from the other electron. So they have these uh, negatively charged ions, and they have this giant CW multiplier, which is huge. It's got the stacked diodes and... Um, capacitors and stuff. Um, and so it's this huge CW multiplier. It's like 175 kilovolts. And so um, the the protons either they f somehow they the heated cesium is either inside the CW multiplier because the top of it is a giant like box. Um, well, actually, it's a giant globe that's electrically connected to the box where I assume where they said that their um, protons start out, so I'm not sure if the cesium is in that box or if the protons are fed in. I'm not sure how they get there, but the proton, negative proton ions end up inside that giant box where they're accelerated to 175 keV um, to this wall, basically. And on the other side of the wall is their LINAC, where they get accelerated to like 7 uh, mega electron volts or something. But the LINAC, this is where I spent, uh, I toured a lot. I saw the very beginning of the LINAC, like right after the CW multiplier. Uh, from lab, you can actually look into the CW multiplier through a room with huge glass walls. Um... And apparently sparks apparently jump, and this is the, you know, this is their tourist attraction for the, um, for the, um, people that come to visit the politicians and stuff. They love to see that, but they're actually looking into replacing this Linac with, uh, shorter, smaller, less, you know, grand, uh, pre-accelerator that's much more efficient. Um, so that if that happens, then they just put the CW multiplier outside as an exhibit outside, just like they've done with one of their old bubble chambers. You can see that in your original Fermilab video. So, um, after the CW multiplier, it goes into the LINAC, as I said. Um, so the LINAC is a this straight line. It's right after the CW multiplier. And so, um, I saw, I saw their claystrons for the LINAC. Claystrons, actually, the way a LINAC works is, you know, it has RF, uh, cavities built into it, and when you feed an RF wave of the correct frequency, the cavity will sustain that frequency and resonate on that frequency, and um, that act causes the protons to actually get accelerated because of the RF wave. So, because these are negative protons, they're going to actually ride the positive edge of the wave. So there's going to be a wave in here in, in the um, RF cavities, and the protons are going to ride the RF wave through the cavities, um, they're going to ride the positive side because they're negative ions because um, of the electrons, and they're going to ride the uh, RF wave. And I saw the claystrons, which are huge. They're like from the floor to the ceiling. They all have all, all sorts of, you know, scopes everywhere with uh, stuff displayed on the scopes and all sorts of, you know, fancy stuff. But really what I saw is claystrons, and um, from the claystrons, there's this sort of metal tube, basically, and it's got sort of boxes, basically, imagine like a straight um, rectangular prism, but the ends have a little inch up, and so those are bolted together, and bolted together, and bolted together, to create this huge RF waveguide, actually from the claystron, goes up, and then over, and then down, the LANAC was actually like the floor below where I was, but it was also 
like um, 20 feet uh, in front of me, basically, if, if I was facing the Klystron. So it, instead of just going over and down, I don't know why they went up and down, but these um, waveguides actually also sustain the um, RF wave for the um, Linac. And these Klystrons, apparently, they're huge, right? Because they have to provide a ton of power. And so um, they're very hard to get because they're actually really old technology. This whole Linac is running on very old technology. Uh, I guess it works fine. They haven't updated it because that'd be really expensive, like prohibitively expensive. But the whole Linac works on old technology, so it's really hard to get these Klystrons for the Linac, you know. Um, we also saw they have some giant, you know, same size as the Klystrons, floor-to-ceiling tube amplifiers, um, which probably, I'm assuming, perform a similar function to the Klystrons or, or feed in the uh, input wave to the Klystrons. You know, they're, they're sort of like a preamp for the Klystrons, I guess, um, would be my guess. They didn't really tell me, but they said, you know, hey, we can hardly ever get these tubes when they break because they're so rare and so old. And so that's really all I saw of the Linac, but it was one of my favorite parts of the tour. It's just it's so cool just to see, you know, all the stuff, you know, you think, oh, well, Linac, it, it sounds simple in theory, right? And the operation of the Linac is very simple. You know, the protons will ride, the, the pro uh, hydrogen ions, sorry, will ride the positive edge of the wave. But it's really complicated, all this stuff they have going into it. They have, like, rack mount things just... I mean, this I saw those like support stuff, right? The stuff that actually runs the Linac. I didn't see the Linac itself because they were running, and so radiation is an issue. But, um, you know, oh my god, it was like a ton of stuff. And the Klystrons were really neat because they were so, you know, so huge. And the Klystrons also run on many, on high voltage. They have all sorts of high voltage systems to provide that. So that's that's really what I saw of the Linac. And the, I've seen a picture of the inside of the Linac, and it's uh, copper, copper cavities. They're basically like, um, not like spheres, but they're, they're like each the same length of cavity. But... In each cavity, it is sort of circular on the inside, so it's like a curved wall, a flat ceiling, a curved wall, and there's a little two or three inch gap in the middle of all of them, like a hole in the middle of all the, the cavities so it can go through. So um, I didn't take a picture of that, but maybe I can find one on the Fermilab's website or something, so I don't know whether you see this or not, but there's a hole that the protons go right, I should say hydrogen ions, they go right through and then they get... Um, accelerated by the RF wave. So after exiting the Linac, the protons go into the booster. Now at some point here, I'm not sure whether it's before the booster or after the booster when they get injected into the main injector. I should mention their whole accelerator chain now is that um, they have the um, CW multiplier, the Linac, the booster. The booster sends the most of the protons to the main injector which sends them to Tevatron or when Tevatron was running I should say. And then um, sends the booster sends part of the protons to the antiproton source, which then sends the antiprotons to the recycler, which sends them to Tevatron um, when it was running again. And now they just send the protons out of the booster to the um, Numi beam line, which creates the neutrinos for Minos, Minerva, and Nova. Um, and they also feed it to like the Mini Boon experiment, which is a really old, old neutrino experiment that I really didn't see too much. So, um, okay, so the booster. Either at some point entering the booster or exiting the booster, I forget, I'm sorry. Um, this is the reason that they actually have, they, that they haven't removed an electron, they've added one, is that it helps them to combine the beams. So, I assume it's exiting the booster. The booster must have multiple paths, or combining the bunches from the booster. Again, I wasn't clear on this, um, but I'm sorry for that, um, lack of detail. But somehow there's multiple beams, or multiple bunches, or multiple somethings, and they need to be combined successfully. I'm assuming it's bunches from the booster, but again, it could be bunches from the Linac, or the booster could have multiple beams, but I, I don't think it does, so it's bunches from either the booster or the Linac. They need to be combined together, and so having the electro extra electrons allows them to just combine the bunches easier. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why. Um, to produce a higher luminosity, or higher intensity, or higher energy, or something, but it's, it's very... It's helpful for them, or necessary for them, to combine the bunches or combine the beams again, either after the right, either from the uh, booster exiting to the main injector, combining the beams from the the bunches from the Linac. So I'm not sure um, on that, but that's that's why they have the extra electron, is it allows them to get a higher energy luminosity or or intensity from either the booster or the um, Linac to actually combine the whatever they're combining. Again, I wasn't sure. Um, so the booster, I didn't really see the booster at all, or they didn't tell me about the booster, I didn't really ask about the booster at all, so I really, really don't know much about the booster, 
and all except this is it's round building and it's probably similar to most synchrotron boosters that exist again i haven't seen i haven't seen any other ones um so we did over ground we we obviously drove past all the stuff we drove past the um anti-proton source which is in sort of like a triangle and there's these um buildings they're like oh my god um i'm trying trapezoid trapezoidal buildings trapezoidal prism buildings and there's three of them and in there they have some sort of static target i don't know what it's made of um but you can look it up it's most definitely on their website um, and so they shoot part of the uh, protons from the booster into this static target where, like, out of a million, five or six will actually produce antiprotons. And so they can filter out the rest of the particles through, you know, obviously antiprotons have a negative charge, so they can do half their filtering, just, like, get mo away most of the particles with the opposite, or all the particles with the opposite charge, which is probably most of the particles they're producing, just with magnets that would, you know... Uh, focus antiprotons and defocus everything else and then probably through just tuning their detector they can get it so that the the antiprotons only go through the recycler and what the recycler is is basically storage for antiprotons so because they're producing so few antiprotons from a ton of protons uh, obviously they need to get more antiprotons so they can have this high energy proton beam with all, all these antiprotons to match the amount of protons so they store them in the uh, recycler, and I didn't go in the tunnel, but they told me that if you were to actually go in the tunnel, the recycler is on top and the main injector on, is on the bottom. So, you know, the antiprotons all go through this recycler before they get to Tevatron. They don't just come right out of the source, because that would take forever. So they go, and the recycler also ramps up, ramps up their energy, excuse me. And so also from the booster, most of the uh, protons go to the main injector, which is sort of analogous to CERN's um, super proton synchrotron, um, in that it, it boosts, it gives the protons another boost, um, and it really was very helpful to Fermilab um, for increasing Tevatron's, um, um, the main injector increased the particle collisions in Tevatron, increased the number of collisions, so it doesn't, the main injector is actually not necessary for Tevatron to run, but it, it dramatically increases their um, amount of um, successful collisions and uh, collisions between the protons and, and the antiprotons in Tevatron. Um, so that's the main injector. Again, we drove around. It's actually not circular. It's oval. I assume this is because it's, it's space constraints, because I'm looking at my map right here, and it's actually right on the edge of Fermilab's um, land. Um, so, you know, I, I assume it's just oval, because if it was circular, it would actually go off their property. So it's probably oval for no physics reason, but just for land reason. And so all around the main in, uh, injector... Uh, recycler slash recycler. I'm not really quite sure what to call it uh, because of the dual functionality, as I said before. Um, there's water. There's like canals, and they actually pump the water through the canals, and they circulate it very slowly. Obviously, like a very slow moving river. You know, if you've ever been in a river and there's a flat section, and it appears that it takes you like you know 20 minutes to go a mile or something. Right. This would be the speed of that water, really slow. But since um, the main injector, I I'm pretty sure it actually uses you know, room temperature magnets, regular magnets, not superconducting. They actually use this water to cool it. I'll talk more, more about this on the Tevatron video. Um, but they they use the water to cool the magnets, I assume, for both the, I guess, both the recycler and the um, main injector, although I'm not sure. Maybe the main, the main injector was successfully completed in 1999, so I don't know if by then the main injector would actually be using superconducting magnets and it would just be the recycler using... Um, uh, room temperature magnets, but one of the two used to or currently does, I'm pretty sure one of them currently does use room temperature magnets, um, so they have the water cooling for that. Again, the, the um, canal isn't continuous, but they pump the water continuously through the ring, or the oval, I really should say it's an oval, um, for the main injector recycler to actually cool the whole thing. So that's really it for the accelerator chain. Um, I should say for the neutrinos, uh, actually, the um, beam comes out of the booster, and and right after it comes out of the booster, it interacts with their target, and this is where I start, this is where I pick up in the neutrino video, I said that collides with their target, produces pions and kaons, which are filtered by, like, this two um, cones stuck together with the small ends together with the coils with half a million amps running through them, where that is focused and then they decay through the decay pipe into particles and muon neutrinos and then there's solid rock and 
it's solid rock all the way till the near detectors, um, and obviously solid rock will filter out everything except neutrinos. So that's really their, um, their accelerator chain, starting out with the CW multiplier, moving on to the LINAC, and then the booster, and then the main injector um, recycler. So that's that. And the main injector recycler is actually completed in time where it was really difficult to get funding. So uh, they're pretty lucky that they actually have that because um, it's, you know, it's difficult to get funding and all. Um, but uh, that's, that's really it. I really don't know much more. So thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed learning something about uh, Fermilab's accelerator chain.